After the drama and heartache of the opening leg, the six crews of the Volvo Ocean Race, against all the odds, assembled on the start line in Cape Town, ready to do battle with each other and Mother Nature once again. Ahead, four and a half thousand nautical miles to Abu Dhabi, and a journey that would challenge both brain and brawn, pushing the crews to their very limits. We need to go sailing for real again, and it had been a long time. Um, the, the import race is great, but there's nothing like doing what you're really supposed to be doing, that's going offshore. The three boats that failed to complete the first leg were all back in the fleet, ready to race. I think we were back to full, full speed, really. Um, I guess the only thing is you had the sort of nagging doubts in the back of your mind of, as, to, um, as to how strong the new system would be. And so it just it maybe took a few days to, to get, in, get sort of fully into it. But um, I think looking back on it, we were at 100%. Head here. Ease a little. All certainly seemed 100%. It was a dream start for Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing on their leg home. But a little further along the coast, the mountains caused huge wind shadows and the boats began to slow. Left the cape down, shape, and parked. Everybody's come back up to us, so we probably shouldn't have bothered. That's that wind. Throw this, sitting in a hole, flying around. In a role reversal of form, the usually faultless Team Telefonica made an error which left them trailing at the back of the fleet out of touch and in an unfamiliar position. To take a risk early on is, is not sensible and we, we probably didn't get that balance quite right. We, we were hoping to stay out of trouble but stay in the pack and, and uh, I think it was probably quite obvious on the outside we certainly stayed out of trouble. But, um, we weren't anywhere near the pack. The winds died, got progressively less and less overnight and um, coming to this headland we found more and more current. And in fact, we got to a stage where we were going backwards. So it's better to put the anchor down and stay where we are rather than go backwards. Um, hopefully the wind will pick up soon and we'll carry on on our merry way, but not, not in the plan this, not in the brochure. Camper and Group Armour battled offshore to get better breeze and returned to the fleet with a slight gain. But after calm conditions in the opening segment, the first challenge for the fleet was the exact opposite. The Gulas current is a very strong current from the north. It can be running you know, three, four knots, and uh, it's maybe about 80 miles across. If you get strong um, westerly winds or southwesterly winds, then, then they'll be opposing those currents. You can get very, very steep seas. Um, so you know, it was with some trepidation that we approached that part of the world and certainly when we first headed out uh, on starboard tack to try and go across the current, you know, the sea state was absolutely horrific and um, we took the decision to jibe back north in the hope that further up the coast the sea state would be better, which it indeed was. The last two hours have just been punching into you know, fairly horrendous head-on seaway. So 20 knots, that 20 knots wind against the sea and probably a bit of current as well. So uh, starboard jive hasn't been an option until now. Now we're into it. It's not great, but it's turning a lot better than it was. Hopefully the next couple of hours should settle down a bit more and let's get on our way. Uh, we're heading into one of the strongest currents in the world uh, that has developed its own little low pressure. So we got about 100 miles of pure crap tonight. If there were question marks on the rig, that's when they would have gotten sussed out. It sure felt like the boat was airborne a couple of times, literally airborne. Um, big, big waves. You know, you're going downwind in 26 knots of breeze, all your gear up, masthead gear up, uh, going fast, and, and these big swells essentially coming straight at you. It was a case of slow, slow, quick, quick, slow as the fleet danced its way along the coast and out into unprotected water where it came up against its first strategic obstacle of the leg, causing plenty of furrowed brows at the navigation stations. Essentially you've got, we had a, there's a big high pressure that was in the Indian Ocean and there's another high pressure 
that was trying to ridge in under South Africa. Um, and between the two high pressures, you've got a an area of low pressure. And so there was a trough line that initially, but when we started, looked like we could be on the front of it, and that would be our, our ride to the east. And this, as we got slower, it was clear that uh, we were now on the back of that uh, uh, trough system. Most frontal lines, first of all, move faster than the boats and have power in them, have kick to them. This is a really, this is just strong enough a front to hold together to move very, very slowly with no punch to it whatsoever. So it's literally, then the boats move faster than the front did. You have a choice. You either head way north of it, way south of it, or try to punch through. And it was moving just fast enough with just wide enough a light air zone in the mix of it that you could never punch through. Bit of everything, I think, uh, through the next 24 hours as we go through the different phases of this uh, intensifying road. And uh, probably a bit of upwind early on and then uh, <clears throat> hopefully we can sail around it or at least stay on the north side in the downwind uh, airs. in northerly 25 knots and thought fantastic we're through talking with the other boats they a number of them broke through multiple times but then what would happen is the thing would speed up again and roll over the top of you and you'd find yourself on the back of it we came very close to breaking through yesterday very 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 close there's another line looked about five miles on the bow if we punched through that we were we were gone but couldn't quite make it the front got a bit of pace on and swallowed us up again, so we're back in the line with everyone else. It was, it was one of the more frustrated moments of my, uh, <coughs> my yacht racing career. You see this cloud line behind us? That's the other edge of it, and there'll be so a couple of miles back past that, that'll be blowing 25 knots, 30 knots. So we'll probably get swallowed up by that and have 30 knots and be all on tonight at some stage and then get back into this lighter stuff tomorrow as this whole thing sweeps across. Well, the risk of getting through, of somebody else getting through and you not, was what kept pushing everybody. There's no doubt about that, because everybody had that vision in the back of their minds. I guarantee on every single boat was uh, watching the transom of a boat on, on the other tack, on port tack, taking off into the distance while you're just sitting there slatting. That, that was the fear. To me, that was the driver. That was the driver of the whole thing, is being left in the dust. We knew how important it was to be first out of that front. Um, and I guess it was made a little bit difficult, more difficult for us because we punched through it on that first day just and, and only to, to have it overtake us again. So we had a little sniff of, of life on the other side of it and, and we knew it was possible to, to get through this thing. Um, and that probably sort of led us to persist a harder than, harder than um, you know, boats like Group Armour who, who uh, you know, went and took matters into their own hands and went around it. In hindsight, those guys with their mulch hull experience, they, they probably come across situations like that more, more often than we do. It was important to choose where to position ourselves in relation to the fleet which was roughly to the south. Our first option was that there was a possibility far to the south, and that's why at the start, we were the most southerly boat in the first instance. It was a relatively extreme option. We looked at what the rest of the fleet was doing and noticed that very few were actually following. We said to ourselves that we don't want to head off all alone again. So for a time we said, OK, we're not going to take this option, we're going to come back towards the fleet and see what happens. 
Ultimately, we felt we could zigzag behind until we found the right gap. So we headed south again, just as the trough moved east. We followed it, but we drifted south. The more time passed, the more weather forecasts showed that there was an area of low pressure which was going to finally allow us to break through. So it all worked out very well, and 30 hours later, we were in a very good position indeed. We thought it would be even better than it turned out. But that's how we came to make our decision. Voilà, donc c'est comme ça qu'on a pris la décision. Dans cette situation précise, il y avait in that specific situation, I don't think I was taking a risk, because there was the trough which was restricting the progress of the entire fleet. So you can go off 200 miles to the south without losing any ground to the east. This is because you could do it a lot quicker, as you were towards the back of the trough compared to those who were constantly in the middle of it. That's why I say, in that specific situation, there wasn't a great risk involved, as you were always on the same longitude as the others, even if we had a lot more distance to travel behind the trough. But yes, it's true that in France we're used to acting a little like that. That approach comes a little from multi-holes, as they are able to very quickly create huge gaps. We're used to sailing with those gaps, with the rest of the fleet, and we know that they are won and lost very quickly. With single hull boats, it's a little less pronounced, but it also happens. So it's true that it is a habit which is a little extreme when it comes to what you need to do in the Volvo. We haven't yet figured out why we are all alone in the South. We tried to rejoin our colleagues, to behave like good pupils, but our classmates didn't want to stay with us. We've had a tiny window to try and cross this messy weather system, which is slowing down all the fleet at the moment. Since this morning, we've been in the decisive phase, when we are crossing through that tiny window also known as the eye of the needle. It's getting more and more real now, and will soon jibe north again, because we're almost at 40 degrees south. We've found the albatrosses, and now at last, we're heading towards the sun. It's true that we don't necessarily play the game based on where the rest of the fleet is. We don't wait for a race, we try to use the weather conditions. It's perhaps also a habit that comes from breaking records on your own. And what you need in that case is how to best come through these weather conditions. So we're used to being aggressive with those conditions. Sometimes they can be a fair distance from the route, so you have to go and find them. We need to reach them even if they're a long way off our course. And if the rest of the fleet doesn't share our view, well, obviously we'll find ourselves all alone at some stage. And that's where you have a dilemma, because when you're alone, you really hope you're right. Because if if you're wrong, you can lose a great deal. When Group Palmer made that break, made their intentions clear, I can remember KP saying, well, I wouldn't be surprised if these guys do very well out of this, but it's a, it's a risk I don't think that we were prepared to, to, to take and we wanted to stick it out with the rest of the guys. There's two ways you can race these boats, really. One, you can race the fleet. Um, or two, you can just race the weather and, and just whatever the fleet do, you can you can do what you think is right for any given weather situation. If you're fast, then why wouldn't you race the fleet? Because you just stay near everybody in the hope that you're going you're gonna to beat them in the end. So um, uh, for sure, uh, Frank and John Luke seem to have a slightly different style, but you know, it doesn't make it wrong. Um, I guess the skill is knowing when to back your judgment and when to race the weather and, uh, and when to just stick with the fleet or cover the fleet. The constant sail changes bashing against the front and the proximity of the fleet had taken its toll on the sailors. Although used to sleep deprivation, our intrepid voyagers were suffering from even less rest than usual. So the last 24 hours of um, pretty hard going. We've had, we've had boats around us the whole time, so it's always been push, push, push. We haven't had sleep in a long time. The last couple of days have been pretty hard. But anyone's had a full off watch yet without quite a 
big sail change going on or sell. A lot of people take those power gels, try and just you know, eat some food, make sure you're drinking all the time. Like I'm the worst, I just nod off now in the game. <laughs> you looking forward to finally getting to bed? Uh, yes, I really am. Uh, look at it. I'm already, I'm already an hour late. This is how it rolls, huh? I'm sure I'll be up in an hour, but I'll make use of the hour in between. With Group Armour already heading south, choosing to race the weather as opposed to the fleet, Team Sanya decided to roll the dice and go north to seek out faster conditions. Yeah, so we've been looking at uh, this northerly option for a few days. We felt pretty stupid because it was obvious that if we had done it 12 hours ago, it would have been looking really good. Sailing into the low pressure and getting a shift in the north instead of trying to push this push through this core front to the east which is really difficult which we've been trying for a couple of days i mean just to keep sailing behind uh, puma and camper uh, isn't, isn't gonna win us the leg and as, as well grafama has gone really far south and looking pretty good with that so uh, you know if we didn't want to be trailing in the middle then then uh, this is a good option for us well we're going this way and Abu Dhabi are over there going that way. <laughs> we are going 180 degrees. 180. We actually saw them about a mile away from us, uh, passing behind us. So, you know, we were aware they were doing it. We were aware there was possibilities. And if, you know, with the weather routing, you, you could easily have believed that they could have ended up a day ahead of the fleet. Um, but I think if you were going to do it, you needed to do it earlier um, than they did it. Otherwise, you couldn't get round the northern side of the of the low. The meteorological models do a very bad job of handling just how a tropical cyclone is going to move. So uh, from a risk reward perspective, um, I rejected it 100% as being the wrong thing for us to do. So it, it's, it's probably the right call for them. That's where they're at. They, they, they've said from the word go, they're going to, if they see opportunities, they're going to seize it. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to take chances. And uh, you know, I admire them and respect them for doing that. At the moment, we're just about to sail into the strongest airs. Uh, it's about 35 knots at the moment, so hopefully it's not going to increase too much more. But uh, for sure, this is some gusts of 40 and maybe some more. So, but uh, all in control for now. We're sailing with uh, two reefs and a storm tip. And we're going to take the third reef if it starts blowing anymore. The gamble appeared to be working. Sailing in a more consistent breeze, Sanya charged into the lead, but it was by no means easy going. It's technically faster, they'd, they'd gain in the short term, they'd have a slightly harder time in the trade winds getting across to our line. Um, but I think there probably would have been small gains there, but to, to get those gains they had to stay in one piece. Yeah, well, it's all a bit dis disappointing and sad here on the uh, Team Sanya boat. Um, we had just uh, pretty much broken through the, the low pressure system, and um, we were very excited about the, fa the fact that the breeze was going right, um, which meant that, um, as we hoped, there was a little secondary low for us to use to kind of propel us east and um, really capitalise uh, on these um, miles to the mark that we'd gained. And we were going for a sail change and uh, David Rolf was running a lured sheet for the new fractional zero and uh, looked up in there the, the D2, the piece of rigging that comes from the mast um, to the, the bottom spreader um, was flapping in the wind. And um, unfortunately, that's the end of our race. It's, um, if what we need to be thankful for is we were not far off doing attack. Um, it um, was very, 
you know, we were just lucky that, that that'll happen in daylight. Um, if it happened in the dark, for sure we wouldn't have noticed it. And we would have tacked over and the mast would have fallen down instantly. So, um, yeah, all in all, incredibly gutted. You know, we've now had to pull out of a uh, second leg. Um, I've never pulled out of a leg in four Volvo races until the last one, and now it's two in a row. So, um, yeah, I can't, words can't explain it, to be honest. Just devastated. As Team Sanya limped towards Madagascar to attempt to repair their mast, the rest of the fleet had finally made it through the front, with Group Palmer leading the way, although perhaps by not as much as they would have hoped. We crossed the, the trough, it was, it was pretty obvious Group Palmer were going to be ahead. It was just a question of whether they were going to be 100 miles or 300 miles ahead. Um, you know, they'd made their move, they were completely dependent on us not crossing the trough sooner. Uh, that having not happened, they'd, they'd, you know, they clearly were going to gain out of it. And um, we got to the trough finally about, uh, you know, exactly on the line of the leaders. And by now we were about 20 miles behind them. But it was a little bit later in the day, the clouds had bubbled up. You know, very tough period for us and, uh, you know, and heartbreaking to see a 20 mile lead turn into what we knew was probably going to be 150 by the time it was all done. Well, we always hope to be the first boat through this line. We still have a very critical line. The problem is two boats have stuck around the end, so they've both done really well, but well, we're going to try and try and catch them. We really liked our spot. We wanted to set up to weather of the other two guys, which we did. We knew the first day and a half was going to be advantage to them, just in pressure. But um, the last couple of days were going to come good for us, and sure enough, they did. And you know, we came out 12, 15 miles ahead of Telefonica, and 35, 40 miles ahead of Camper at that point. We allowed Telfani to set up a little bit on the inside of us, about 10 miles on the inside of us. So um, they had a little bit of leverage on us, um, but also, you know, those guys are reaching uh, pretty fast. In hindsight, we had a couple of incorrect sails on at the time. Conditions were still quite changeable. They weren't um, as they were before the chopper. They were quite changeable. And um, if you just simply changed the best sail you could at every opportunity that came, I think you'd find you'd lose a lot of ground. So there's this whole thing of trying to get a sail configuration that's going to go through the range in the next 24 hours or so. And, and it won't be perfect, but it's, it's the best compromise you've got. We made some miles up, just, just through boat speed, I think. It's not a shock to see Camper and Telefonica and uh, Puma together quite a bit. When you think about it, in the last race, uh, KP and I sailed together. Um, uh, Tom Addis and Ikar sailed together. Uh, uh, Will Oxley was part of our navigational team, who's the navigator on, and, and Chris Nicholson was with us for the first couple legs, or first three legs. So there is a bit of incest amongst those three boats as to how you sail these boats. So I would say it's not a shocker to see those three sailing similar styles and similar places on the race course. Meanwhile, Team Sanya had reached their next port of call safely, but that was only the first of their issues dealt with. There were plenty more problems to be solved on land. So here we are at Team Sanya in Ehola, a um, little port at the southern tip of uh, Madagascar. Um, obviously incredibly relieved, incredibly relieved to be here with the, the mast in one piece. Um, stressful, you know, 30 odd hours. Um, with, you know, still a, quite a rough sea state, um, trying to get the boat here, so uh, quite a big relief for that. Um, it's going to be really tough here, you know, it's uh, very third world, very, very third world, no, nothing I've experienced before. And, um, you know, just trying to deal with the logistics of trying to uh, pull a mast out, um, uh, do a whole new rigging solution, uh, get the boat back up and running, it's going to be tough. The whole thing was where you wanted to jump into the doldrums and whether we wanted to shift sides. And, you know, uh, we, we set our spot in the doldrums pretty far out, and uh, I've said this a million times, 
it, this is not a simple scenario. And you talk to every one of the navigators and everybody was terrified of everybody else's position. Once you're in the doldrums and you've got no wind, you can't position yourself. And all you really can do is try and pick a longitude that you think is going to be most successful. We've decided that we thought that our best chance of getting through the doldrums was in the east. And we could see Telefonica below us hedging. They weren't, weren't taking the Puma Group Armour Road and they weren't taking our road. And then slowly but surely they opted and their course over ground changed to match ours and then go higher than ours. Now, I suspect from their perspective, they see us as the biggest threat. We certainly see them as our biggest threat. And so they came across to, to our line uh, and then across it. It's true that we had a bit of a lead coming into the doldrums and we had a great chance to get right in there. And that's what we did, as a small area of low pressure enabled us to open the sails and that allowed us to keep the wind for a while. But once we got into the doldrums, all of our routing said we could go through the middle and find wind on the other side. And that's what we did for around 10 hours. But after the doldrums, the whole fleet came back and we were almost in the worst possible place. We had no wind and it was impossible to get back to the others. We were wrong, they were right. The guys that went uh, further to the right, further to the east, heading north, um, were correct and we weren't in Group AMA. So the two leaders were wrong and third and fourth were right. It's twice now that we've struggled in the doldrums. In both the first and second leg, we lost time in those areas and we need to understand why. That big rain cloud ahead, once we get past it, we'll be on the line of convergence and then whoosh. We became even more radical in our direction against the wind and went even further east, trying to go around that area of low winds. And in the end, that was the right decision, as we were able to go around them, Puma and Grupama, who were clearly ahead. They had so little wind and took so long to get out of that area that we were able to go around them, even though we were slower. In the Indian Ocean there are a lot of atolls and they're not well charted. Um, we had the best charts available and they were surveyed in 1880 by uh, an Indian surveying team using a lead line. That's just a, you know, a bit of string and a, um, a lead on the end. And then the outlines of the reefs were done using satellite photos, so, so pretty sketchy data. We knew there'd be compression just because we were the leaders going in a lighter zone, so hence they compress up to us. Um, we, we got nailed by a pretty average cloud just before the first atoll, to which um, Telfani were a bit further removed. And other than that, you know, I think in, in the night time when we were going around the first atoll, they were right on our transom, very, very close in the middle of the night, and I think we still had over 200 miles to go. And you kind of knew just there and then that you're in for a long, drawn-out battle. We caught them up little by little and were lucky when we got to a zone with atolls where Camper had to turn and when we saw them passing across our bow, they were three or four miles away. We could see them, we could see their lights and then we started to race them. With a couple hundred miles to go, we could actually see Group AMA on our radar in front of us. And that's when we started coming up to the atolls that, that we had to sail around. And 
um, that's when the team really got fired up again. You know, it was business as usual up till that, and all right, we're back to we're boat racing again. Here we go. Let's let's pass this boat and. Uh, Stuck with it. We were quick in that condition. They made a little mistake. We capitalize on it, and we win our little battle. We were never going to get to the point of getting close to Telefonica or Camper at that point, which we were, uh, we had mentally come to terms with, come to grips with. But, but uh, we did have our own little match race, and and it was good to see the troops uh, kind of rise to the occasion and put it away. Christmas Day was marked by tropical downpour and sustained winds of 35 to 40 knots. Oh, it's absolutely dripping wet. People are tired and, um, yeah. yeah. Happy Christmas. What more can I say? Father Christmas hasn't come. He went elsewhere this time. Well, that's not quite true. He did bring me something quite nice. A cover for my computer. Well, that was good. But it was the wrong colour. I think it may be meant for someone else. But don't get me wrong, I'm still happy. I'm still happy managed to visit. To be honest with you, mate, there was a lot of talk about Christmas Day and then on Christmas Day, Hamish pulled out a couple of bits of chocolate, bits of candy and that. That was about it. To be honest, it was, you yeah, know, you're not going to get a whole lot of Christmas cheer from me. When I'm racing at sea, 95% of the time, I'm thinking about how to sail the boat. I don't really care about Christmas. They kind of taste terrible, but, but we're going to eat every single one of them. My wife, Kathy, God bless her, snuck on some, some Christmas cheer and you know, the poppers that you pop and the hats and the little shot bottles of Amarillo, which goes really good in coffee, by the way. You know, we took 45 minutes and acted like real people. J'ai l'impression pour les anglo-saxons, c'est un peu plus important. I get the feeling it's more important in the English-speaking world. C'est un moment où... I don't wake up on board and think, it's Christmas and that'll make my day. What makes my day is when there's more wind. We travel faster and we gain positions. As a marine biologist, having spent 25 years around reefs, I'm pretty comfortable navigating around reefs in the daytime. I'm also not very comfortable around reefs at night time. But we decided to go on the western side of the first of these major uh, atolls we were dealing with and, and uh, Telefonica stuck with us. So I'm a little nervous because the way our routing's going, these, one of these things is going to be right in the way. You turn left as you go north and that makes the corners of the reefs a passing lane. So in order to stop someone passing you, you have to be hard on to the edge of the reef. You can be certainly safer, you just take things wider, but uh, you always have one of the opposition go inside you and, and beat you. Uh, we found ourselves um, uh, in late afternoon, uh, about 60 metres off a reef edge. No depth, so the depth is still a thousand metres, but the reef is 50 or 60 metres away. There is a swell, uh, we're surging, and we can see the surf breaking just, just there. And we've got Telefonica three boat lengths behind us. <laughs> and we're both just uh, slowly doing you know, four or five knots, just uh, weaving back and forth, trying to find an opportunity for us to stay in front and for them to get past. As the fleet headed towards an undisclosed safe haven port in the Indian Ocean, where the boats would be loaded and shipped to the Northern Emirates for phase two of the leg, the shore crews had gathered to supervise the loading of the precious and fragile cargo. I talked to Craig at, at seven this morning and 
their ship is still due to be in just after midnight. So I'll spend today trying to see if we can get customs to clear the boat after hours tonight so that in the morning it's already cleared and they're not trying to clear customs. Uh, camp is still in front at the moment, 140 miles to go. She's doing 11 knots and all the boats are doing between 9 and 11 so we'll be looking at right on dusk tonight I think. In fact, night had already fallen as the two leading boats, Camper with Emirates Team New Zealand and Team Telefonica, charged towards the safe haven, negotiating the dual dangers of atolls and reefs, as well as each other in total darkness. Nervous times for both competitors. Here we are, 30 miles from the finish. For the last 24 hours we have been really sticking to Camper. Uh, the distance has been never more than a mile, so here we are, trying our best to see if we can still beat them. The Telefonica is starboard by about one mile away. It's slowly catching. Long way to go. This race is going to be nine nice. days. Something you write movies about, mate. ourselves uh, in close quarters jiving jewel with um, Telefonica um, and it was a bit like everyone was on a um, you know an elastic band and so it was a pretty nervous time for me and I'm the only one looking at the chart the rest of the boat is concentrating on a boat on boat situation it was dark dark night um, we could hear the wave breaking I mean thundering waves breaking and um, I wasn't looking at the chart at the time but I'm pretty close, pretty, pretty aware that we're within 20 metres of being hard and, hard and fast to the ground on the rocks. It was intense, it went on and on and on. Um, we very rarely got more than a mile apart and sometimes we're less than 40 or 50 metres apart. We were within uh, you know, shouting distance and um, Telefonica, you know, I could hear KP, a nervous voice going, you can't go in there. <laughs> we actually came out from the reef edge on starboard uh, and they passed behind us. And we were sailing all over the ocean. We weren't going, the, the, the longer we made the race, the more chance we had. What would, Camp would have liked us to do was point at the mark and they'd have just stayed in front of us. Of course, our, our game plan was to try and, try and elongate the race, take the race away from being an easy straight line leg. Uh, and we sailed very high um, and they came, followed up with us. They, I think unfortunately for them, they sailed into a hole and we just sailed around. They literally came down parallel to the coral and went literally around our bow, so they, they a one mile lead that took us days to, days to work on and to develop um, disappeared in about 10 minutes. We've uh, just rolled the Kiwis, They're behind us you can see that green light probably, and uh, now we're coming up. I might have to come and help Ryan. Whoever's ahead is then battling to stay ahead and the guy behind is on the attack again but of course time runs out and eventually if you look at it um, we were very fortunate to make that leap into the lead when we were that close to the finish. It was a hard fight that was very very difficult because Camper was extremely aggressive. They were ready to take big risks. We didn't want to let them through, so we had to do it. I remember being in total agony and also being very nervous, as there was a lot of danger. You can't put what you did into a leg like that um, and lead as often as we did and not feel 
not feel gutted for sure. You know, that's that's the probably the appropriate word for it. It's a great boost in confidence. It just makes us feel uh, a little stronger um, going into the next leg. We're also very, very realistic. You know, it's a long, long way to go. Um, we've only really scratched the surface of the race, um, uh, and, and we're just going to have to keep fighting. But in general, finishing where we did is a great thing for us. Agony and ecstasy in equal measure. Five hours after the conclusion of that epic duel, Puma Ocean Racing crossed the finish line. Proud of the team for sticking with it. Really hard leg, uh, both physically and mentally. Very, very hard leg. Uh, lots of lead changes, ups and downs, great moments, mistakes. You know, we'll take our podium. Very proud of grinding down uh, Group Ama there when we really had no right to. So. Uh, that just hopefully shows to the resolve of the group and uh, happy to be in this beautiful undisclosed location. The following morning, Group Armour sailed into port. Once again, the French team had taken a lone path, and this time it had almost paid dividends. Almost. Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing was the last team to arrive at the safe haven. 13 and a half hours adrift of Team Telefonica. Leo, it really fought pretty hard all legs to get back in the race after dropping on behind everybody in the front and had a, had a whiff of that during the doldrums, looked like we were back in and then kind of had it snatched away again. So it's been a pretty tough leg mentally for everybody, but uh, obviously we're disappointed with fifth place. The shipping of the fleet, due to the serious piracy risks of the Indian Ocean, was a complicated matter. Loading the boats on their floating fortress was not a simple maneuver. Well, right now we're in the middle of a port that I can't mention the name of, um, next to a big ship. We're going to pick this boat up and put it on board, and we'll do the last part of the leg from Cape Town to Abu Dhabi on a ship. And that's been done to protect the fleet from piracy, which has become a, a growing problem. And I do believe that these boats present um, a target that looks attractive to them. So I'm, I'm personally quite pleased that we're not put to any more risk than we need to be. Well, a non-sailing job is to look after the rig. You see the size of these hooks, they don't look too big from down here, but they're, they're, they're bigger than a car. And when they're swinging around, it's very easy to damage the rig. It should be okay, but I'm very worried about it. It's not, not, a, not a good day for me. I've been sweating buckets, and I'm going to be sweating buckets for an hour or so more. As the first boat into the safe haven, Telefonica were the guinea pigs, as their yacht was swung onto the enormous transporter. I'm a little bit nervous. The boat is meant to be on the water, but it's not. It's a little bit stressful when the boat is out of the water and is lifted. But everything went well. So that's good, because the guys really know what they're doing. They have to make sure that the boat is fixed properly, in case there are swells or storms. But so far, everything has gone nice and smooth.
The transport headed towards the Gulf and arrived safely in the Emirati port of Sharjah, and it was time to put the fleet back in the water. After all, what goes up must come down. Uh, voilà, donc on a une fissure sur uh, le bateau Groupama. Okay, so we've got a crack in the boat. The problem is that even when the boat is out of the water, we're racing. Our race is just suspended. And the rules of Volvo state that the land-based team must repair the damage. And we can't use the equipment or anything. So we repaired everything ourselves last night with four of the team. So now we're waiting for the leg to end so that we can get the boat out and repair it properly with the land-based team. This was just a, a quick repair job so that we could finish this stage. With all the boats safely in the water, all that was left was the final dash from Sharjah to Abu Dhabi and the end of leg two. I have to say, it feels a bit strange waking up in a hotel bed and, uh, and then sort of the realisation you've got to finish a leg. Just can't wait to turn up in Abu Dhabi and show everybody the boat and see what kind of welcome they uh, provide. Out on the water, conditions were ideal as the boats jostled for position prior to the start of their sprint to Abu Dhabi. The short length of the course ensuring that the initial stages assumed even more importance than normal. All the boats traversing the start line within 10 seconds of each other. Probably great first beat for us and we're bringing up the rear right now, but uh, yeah, the boat speed's getting a little bigger and it's maybe something to look better for us. Telefonica got the jump on the fleet in the early stages, whilst Camper and Puma kept a wary eye on each other. Groupama were in fourth, keeping Abu Dhabi at bay as the boats rounded the first mark. But as the fleet started reaching, Group Armour mounted a charge, sneaking past Puma and Camper, who were absorbed in their own mini-match race, heading towards the leaders, Team Telefonica. With Puma almost tied to their stern, focus on board the Camper boat was keen, eking out every extra fraction of boat speed they could find. Just in the middle of the long stab and tank drag race, and we're actually uh, we're struggling a little bit we had a good start, nice way to the top mark, rounded second. Since then, Telefonica stretched on us, Group Arm has just burned over the top of us. Uh, Puma, Puma we're holding, uh, but they're probably in a little weaker position down to Lewis. So, um, yeah, we've got a bit on to try and, try and hang on to these guys. Having overhauled Puma and Camper, Group Arm had the leaders firmly in their sights, and little by little the French team reeled them in. The Spaniards tried their best to defend their lead against the charging French boat, but to no avail. Frank Camus's team flying towards the magnificent Abu Dhabi skyline and six valuable points. with Emirates Team New Zealand managed to defend their lead over Puma Ocean Racing. And while last place certainly wasn't on the agenda for the home team, nothing was going to wipe the smile from Adil Khalid's face as he brought Azam home. However, overall leg honours went to Team Telefonica, stretching their lead at the top of the table to eight points. It's fantastic. We have an even bigger advantage over the second place boat, and that's something really good. To be on the podium always feels good, so it's great. What more can I say? Thank you very much. 
Camper with Emirates Team New Zealand finished in second overall, maintaining the pressure on the leaders. Puma's third place in leg two closed the gap slightly on their closest rivals, Group Armour. It was a great day for us, a lot of wind, a day when we had a very long reach. The boats in the fleet went very fast in those types of conditions. So we were neck and neck at the final buoy, and it was a great battle with Telefonica at the end. And we finished by overtaking them finally, by the port. So that was the great surprise for us, and we're very happy to be where we are. But the biggest welcome was saved for Zam and the Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing Team. And the fireworks and uh, friends and family, and yeah, just great to be in Abu Dhabi. Fantastic. It was a memorable homecoming for Adil Khalid, the first Emirati sailor ever to take part in the Volvo Ocean Race. The people, they're proud, and I'm proud of my country because all of the people, they came and they looked what's Azam and what's Volvo Ocean about and Abu Dhabi team, Azam team, and everyone dreams to be in my place and to be in Azam and represent Abu Dhabi for sure. As for the notable absentee, Team Sanya completed their repairs in Madagascar and set sail once more heading towards the safe haven and a rendezvous with the rest of the fleet. See you later, boys. We're um, here to be leaving this place. We're, uh, guys have done performed miracles, to say nothing least, and the shore team to you know, get the boat back in shape. And uh, now it's up to us to get the boat there in one piece and get these points on the board and get ourselves back onto a good platform to get into the next leg in good shape. So uh, we've got some interesting weather ahead of us, so we'll just be a little careful the first couple of days out here, but um, otherwise it should be a great trip, so we're looking forward to it.